Hello, everyone. I'm Elliot Mizrahi. I'm the Vice President for Content and Communications at PAGE, and I am so pleased to welcome you to today's PAGE Patrons webinar, which we titled How to Power Your Company and ComTech Strategy with AI. PAGE has been exploring ComTech for the last two years as a way for communicators to better understand stakeholders as individuals, to deepen relationships with them, and to motivate them to action, and to do those things at scale and with precision. Today, AI is increasingly being used to speed analysis and enrich and deepen those insights, making it a force multiplier that will turbocharge ComTech, turbocharge ComTech in the years to come. Today's webinar is part of a series that PAGE has been doing as part of our PAGE Patrons program. Knowing that there are so many ComTech solutions out there, we developed PAGE Patrons as a way to showcase the best of them and to help you understand what they can do. Our webinar today is made possible with support from our page patron, Signal AI, which is one of the leading global companies turning the world's data into knowledge and empowering business leaders across a range of industries to make better decisions. Signal AI is a leading disruptor in the strategic PR and communications market through the use of trainable artificial intelligence, which allows customers to train the Signal AI platform to spot, interpret, and recommend key media and communications insights. The platform's brain, which is named AIQ, can read and interpret over 5 million media and regulation documents a day, surfacing critical media intelligence in real time. Signal AI, uh, Signal AI strategic communications and reputation management customers include multinational banks, law firms, governments, and NGOs. With that, I will hand it over to Jen to take us away. Thank you. All right, thank you, Elliot. Um, I'm really excited to introduce David, who is one of the most dynamic tech CEOs on the planet. I really do believe that. I respect him, his organization, and his technology um, big time. Uh, we use a lot of it at ProSec and with our clients, and he's going to tell us all about it in a minute. Um, many, 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 many accolades for David, including um, one of the most influential people in data and um, part of PR Week's most influential people in communications technology. You could read the rest of his bio, but he's the real deal. So without um, further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to David. Gosh, thank you, Jen, what, a, what an introduction. <laughs> I'm sure I can uh, li live, up, live up to all of that. And uh, thank you, Elliot, as well, and the, the page group for, for having me and, and, and nice to, to meet everyone. So I think I think the, the format for, for today was gonna be, um, I was just going to introduce Signal and, and, and walk everyone through just a couple slides uh, on the business and, and give you guys a bit of a context as to, to what we do and why we founded the company uh, seven years ago. And, and, and then a few case studies just to bring some of that technology to life, because I think that's always most important to, to see how this technology and, and data is actually being applied. And then uh, I'll get through that fairly quickly and was going to have a, a discussion or a fireside chat with, with Jen, which hopefully will be much more engaging and dynamic and looking forward to, to everyone's questions. So good. Uh, so just putting back a second. So, so um, kind of founding story of Signal. I, I founded the company seven years ago, coming up to eight years now uh, with my co-founder, who's an academic. Uh, he did his master's in his PhD in machine learning and artificial intelligence technology. We founded the business in a garage, of course, that, are, that, are, that is owned by my parents. Uh, and normally I start my, my decks uh, with a picture of the garage, but uh, but for some reason we haven't we haven't got that included today. But funny story, when we were raising our seed round of funding, we were about 10, 12 months into the business, just getting going. Uh, there was a real mechanics next door to the garage where we founded the business. And so we would invite venture capital funds over to the garage and they could get their annual cars checked up at a discounted price uh, whilst we pitched them on the business. And I'm sure that was a significant part of the reason why we were able to raise that early funding when we were just... Uh, getting going, but 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 in actual fact, we we started the business under the convergence of a couple trends beginning to to coalesce uh, as as we saw it. A couple really meaningful trends, which I think are as relevant today as they were seven or eight years ago. Uh, the the first trend that we saw was really just the explosion of information and data available to organisations, and yet the fact that despite never having had greater access to information, businesses and business leaders have never found it harder to use that data and information to drive better decision-making within their organizations. I think the second trend or challenge that we saw almost every large company facing is that they're exposed to more risks and issues and threats 
uh, and challenges to reputation than ever before. And yet seven years ago, we didn't feel or see that they were prepared or armed with the sort of radar that would enable them to get ahead of those risks and threats in a more effective and efficient manner. And the third trend or challenge that we saw was that you walk into most large organizations today and there's huge amount of this, uh, amounts of this domain knowledge and expertise which is trapped in the heads of employees who work within these organizations. And it's very difficult for businesses to disaggregate that knowledge and get it out of their heads and across the business in a scalable fashion. The final trend that we saw was the emergence of machine learning, artificial intelli intelligence technologies. Uh, we believe fundamentally we're gonna change the world, but particularly could be applied to those challenges faced by large organizations and with a view to turn those into opportunities. And so our thesis for the business since we founded it seven years ago is if we could aggregate the world's information and be ambivalent about data type and format and modality and language uh, and bring all of that data into a single platform, and then we could apply machine learning and AI that was trainable by experts from within these large organizations. We'd be able to unlock a set of insights that would help business leaders get ahead of those risks, those threats, and manage their, their reputation in a far more effective uh, and data-driven manner. So that journey for us began by aggregating a lot of the world's information. Uh, and we started with traditional media. And today we probably have one of the largest, most comprehensive global data sets of, of media coverage. We do that in 200 markets and in over 100 languages. We translate all of this foreign language content into English in real time, giving our clients this kind of global perspective of what's happening across the media landscape. And that covers both print media and online media and the content that sits behind the paywall. From traditional media, we then moved into more social data. Uh, we cover today millions of blogs, access to chat rooms and forums. And I think we're all aware of this convergence between the social landscape and the social media world uh, and what's happening in the traditional media world. And so increasingly we're bringing in more and more social media data from the myriad of different machine, uh, social media uh, organizations and platforms that are out there. From social data, we moved into regulatory data. So today we cover about 2000 regulatory bodies. Essentially we aggregate everything those regulators say, publish or do. So speech made by a policymaker, white papers, consultation documents, draft law, enacted law, the commentary and interpretation thereafter. And I think we've never been uh, more at a time where kind of regulatory issues and regulatory threats are more closely intersected with reputational issues as well. And so I think that's a, a fascinating data set that we bring into our platform. From regulatory data, we moved into broadcast, so global coverage of TV and radio. Today, we cover thousands of TV and radio channels, which we transcribe automatically from audio and video into text, analyze that text, and link back to that audio video files in real time. And then more recently, have moved into what we describe as alternative data sets. So these are typically more structured, quantitative sets of information. So for example, we're starting to mine fundamental information on companies that you can derive from SEC filings or companies house in the, here in the UK. And this understanding of how to intersect kind of perception and reputation data with more structured performance information related to a company, I think is gonna be one of the big areas that we're gonna see emerge as part of measuring the impact of the work that corporate communications professionals do. And then finally, closely related to that, is our ability to bring in internal data from within an organization and correlate that with all of the external data that we aggregate and pull into our platform. So the first core competency that you can see after seven years is this ability to aggregate and pull into this platform just vast amounts of unstructured diverse data from all around the world in, in many different uh, formats and, uh, and modalities. The second core competency that Signal has then built out over seven years is the application of machine learning and AI to that data to transform it from unstructured text, typically, into more structured knowledge and insight. And we do that in two different ways. One, we've built this machine learning pipeline uh, represented by these different components that we've got on the slide here. And as all of this data that I mentioned before flows through our platform, we push it through this pipeline and we extract from it all of this knowledge and structure. So we can recognize within the information concepts and topics and themes and issues. We can very accurately disambiguate entities so tell the difference between Apple the fruit and Apple the company. We can mine the data for sentiment. We can cluster similar documents together. We can translate it in hundreds of languages. And this ability to kind of apply this machine learning data, none of those components individually are a silver bullet, but they let us take this vast set of data and extract from it this knowledge and structure at scale. And from there, we can then, uh, uh, on top of this platform, bring the value that we're extracting from this data to our customers in a number of different ways. So on top of that platform, we have three ways that we go to market and enable our customers to access this value. The first is that we built a suite of SaaS products, and these products are essentially focused 
on the end user, on the analyst in the uh, in the comms agency, in the in the in the communications leader or professional. And what we want them to be able to do is monitor the information that matters to them more accurately, uh, faster, and from a more, more comprehensive set of data than they can get anywhere else in the market. We want them to be able to intuitively unearth trends and patterns and insights within that data and be able to surface those insights and measure the impact of their work in a really effective way. And then we want them to be able to discover and unearth emerging trends, issues, risks, or threats to their business faster and more rapidly. So that's the first way we go to market through the suite of SaaS products. The second way we go to market is through a suite of API products. And this is a very new area in the kind of context, uh, contact world where essentially the more sophisticated clients that we work with, they don't just want a UI where they can search over the data. They want to be able to pull the value that we've generated within our platform, all of the content, all of the enrichment through the machine learning. And they want to be able to integrate that value into other products and tools that they use. So if they have a CRM system or they have a business intelligence setup where they want to combine internal proprietary data with external perception data, they can start using our API technology to weave this knowledge that we generate within our platform into other areas uh, of their business. And then finally, the, the, the final way we go to market is through partnership, where we, with certain clients, co-create new products on top of our platform, which those clients can then take to their own market. And so we're working with a number of agencies. Uh, it's a very, very exciting space. Uh, as well as large consulting businesses who want to build new products and capabilities on top of this platform and then provide those products and capabilities to their own market uh, and to their own client base. The final thing is that as our customers use the tool, the system is constantly learning and evolving from their interactions. So intuitively, as a customer interacts with our product, the system picks up signals about what is relevant, what isn't relevant, which tags are accurate or otherwise. And then our customers can actually go onto our system and explicitly train up new concepts, reputation pillars, uh, drivers of coverage, issues that they're worried about, and take these fuzzy topics and apply them in a much more quantitative way to this uh, breadth of unstructured data that we're analyzing. One of the byproducts of our platform is this knowledge graph that we've been building, where essentially we're mapping billions and billions of relationships between companies, people, products, ingredients, risks, issues, diseases. And we're starting to enable our customers to navigate this knowledge graph that underpins our platform to find what we describe as unique connections or relationships within the data. So this is enabling us to start uh, uh, helping our customers ask and then answer increasingly more sophisticated and strategic questions of the data. Like what are the emerging competitors I need to be worried about? Are there reputational issues uh, bubbling up in my supply chain? Are there new regulatory risks that I need to be aware of that could become reputational issues? This ability to map all of this knowledge and find the proximity between and the relationship between all of these different things that we're mining is starting to enable our customers to, as I say, answer sophisticated strategic questions uh, for their organizations and their businesses. So if I then uh, show you a, a couple of live examples of how some clients uh, are deploying this technology and, and utilizing it. We're doing some fascinating work with the UK government, uh, as well as uh, uh, members of the other G7 uh, governments uh, uh, around the world. And essentially what we're enabling is the tracking and measurement of their response to COVID and what is driving consumer sentiment and public perception of their activities in that context. So essentially they've been able to, to monitor and track specific topics and issues, whether it's uh, vaccines or contact tracing uh, or, or the rollout of particular uh, communication strategies and understand what the impact of those communication strategies are having across media, uh, social media, policymakers, et cetera, et cetera. We're now working on a, uh, on a fascinating project, looking at specifically at the topic of vaccine confidence, what drives confidence in people actually going and getting their vaccines or otherwise. And we're marrying up media and perception data with actual clinical trial data uh, to, to understand when someone does or doesn't turn up for their vaccine and trying to find those correlations between what are the issues that are being written about in the media and across the social web and how that's driving adoption uh, of the vaccines that are being rolled out across the G7. So a fascinating project, highly strategic, and of course, absolutely critical to uh, the attempt to achieve herd immunity uh, across Europe in the, in the coming months. Another fa uh, fascinating example is the work that we're doing with EY. Uh, this is actually interestingly working with EY in audit. 
Uh, and essentially, audit is under huge amounts of pressure from financial regulators to come up with more non-financial metrics to measure the health of businesses going through the audit process. EY went and did a huge amount of academic research, and they found a correlation between trust in a business and your ongoing likelihood of financial performance. That probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone on this call. Uh, what they wanted to do was then build a way, a framework of measuring how trusted an organization is to then be able to correlate that to your financial performance and weave that into the audit services that they deliver for their, for their clients as, a, as part of that assurance process. So EY came up with a framework for measuring trust. They trained that framework into our machine learning models and any client now going through the audit process is benchmarked and scored against this trust framework, providing the CFO and the audit committee with a quantitative set of scores of how trusted they are. So this is taking a very, very fuzzy topic, historically very difficult to measure and quantify against, and bringing it in as part of a audit process, uh, which as you can imagine, uh, has to be uh, you know, incredibly accurate uh, in order for it to be delivered as part of that process. Uh, another example is the work uh, we're doing with a very large uh, banking client. And this has really been about focusing on trying to help them understand how they're performing against the key reputation drivers that they care about. Climate, digital and technology, being an employer of the future, and internationalism. And essentially, we've created them this real-time dashboard that is presented to the C-suite uh, within this multinational uh, bank. And essentially, enables them to both explore these specific topics and how their reputation is perceived in relationship to those, but it also provides them a much broader market view so that as issues or, or, or sentiment is changing related to these topics in the banking industry or across the globe more generally, we are able to provide them these insights which can then help inform their communication strategy related to these. Again, interestingly, we're weaving in not just media and, and perception data into this analysis, we're also bringing in uh, other business performance metrics like survey data uh, from their employee base, uh, feedback from their clients in structured formats, equity research and analyst reports. So we're actually bringing in a whole disparate set of different quantifiable data and then correlating that uh, with the media and perception data that you might typically run uh, in, a, in a sort of reputation analysis report. So it's going far more broad. And then, yeah, fi final example I'll give is just the work that we're doing with Deloitte. Uh, this, is, this is applying kind of reputation analytics and risk analytics to supply chain resilience. We all know now that issues within one supply chain can be the, the most dangerous uh, 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 source of reputational issues. And there are just countless examples, even over the last six months or so, where businesses have suffered enormously uh, from not you know, understanding and managing these potential reputational issues within their supply chain. We're working uh, with Deloitte to build a new solution. Uh, the client here in question is Sabania Stillwater. They're the, the largest platinum mining firm in Africa. And what we did was we mapped their supply chain throughout Africa. And then we're looking for specific reputational risk signals that might be bubbling up in that supply chain. Uh, labor abuse uh, practice, uh, you know, labor practice abuses, uh, geopolitical risks that might be bubbling up, um, issues to do with the climate and sustainability. And if any of these uh, issues that Sabania Stillwater have highlighted could be threatening to their reputation emerge in conjunction with uh, their supply chain through Africa, we alert them and provide these insights uh, within this intuitive real-time uh, dashboard. So it's bringing in exposure and shining a light across their uh, supply chain uh, in a way that, 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 that historically would have been far more opaque, difficult to track, uh, and close to impossible for a, for a team to do entirely manually. So hopefully this just gives you a sense of, of some of the sort of case studies where kind of global clients that we're working with are starting to use this technology to kind of ask and then answer increasingly sophisticated questions of the data and use that in a much, in a much more cross-functional way in terms of how these reputational issues can affect uh, multiple areas of the business, be it audit, uh, supply chain, um, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that gives you a good sense of, of, of signal on what we do. Just a, a tiny bit of background on the company. I won't dwell on this too long. About 180 employees, uh, offices in London, New York, and Hong Kong. Uh, we've raised a bit of venture capital along the way. Very proud to now service over 600 customers globally. Uh, we're, we're, we're growing very, very fast as a business. Uh, you know, grew phenomenally well. Uh, last year, despite you know all of the challenges 
many organizations unfortunately faced uh, due to COVID. Um, and, you know, very proud of the clients that we're servicing and, and, and looking forward to, to growing more in these coming years. Thank you. All right. That was a lot, but I love the examples. I think those make it very tangible. Tell us, David, in the in the world of um, augmented decision making, I know there was a stat that you shared with me from McKinsey that by some year, maybe you'll remember, we'll yeah. all be um, in the augmented decision audit, decision making business. Tell everybody what that is and what that stat was. I thought it was very compelling. Well, oh, gosh, I can't remember the exact stat, but I think I think the the our general belief is that you know there's a big debate raging right now between artificial intelligence and what we describe as augmented intelligence and i think you know there are actually very very few examples real examples out there in the world right now of artificial intelligence being applied purely in in a way that could replicate human ingenuity and intelligence um, and actually, there's, there's a whole host of very disappointing examples out there as well. I think we're big proponents of augmented intelligence. And what we mean by that is that these technologies will naturally become an extension of the way that we work already. So I don't think, we, in my personal view, and when I work at the coalface of this industry and this technology, we're going to see large amounts of knowledge workers and experts replaced by this technology. We're, we're potentially decades away from that, uh, if it will happen ever. But what I do think we're seeing is, is this technology becoming very integrated into almost every aspect of both our consumer and our enterprise lives, whether that's calling in a cab on Uber, playing a, a playlist on Spotify, or you know, getting your media clippings every morning via your media monitoring solution, we are seeing this technology weave itself in in a much more natural and extended way of how we already do uh, do business and live our lives. And I think that is super exciting. And and what I think that will enable is for professionals to actually be supercharged for them to be able to combine their expertise, their creativity, their ingenuity with the the power and breadth that this technology can provide for them. And it is through that combination and synthesis that we'll see some really fa fantastic uh, examples and results, essentially. I thought the example that you gave me about Unilever, which was not part of your slide deck, but I thought, think is extremely compelling, is worth bringing up, because in some ways it's about um, almost more predictive risk management. And I thought that might be really interesting for people uh, to understand. And again, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will... I will call on you or ask your question. Go ahead, David. No, thank you. Um, yeah, no, another fascinating example. And as you say, I mean, one of the one of the new areas that Signal is certainly to suddenly exploring more and more is how we can take all of these signals that we derive from the data to try and predict or preempt issues, reputational crises before they occur. Uh, we were doing a fascinating piece of work with. Uh, a major FMCG business, Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, Unilever, where we took their 5,000 most used ingredients in their cons consumer goods products. And essentially, we built an index um, that looked for early warning signs of reputational threat or risk within that, within that list of ingredients. And so we were tracking in real time. I mean, you just couldn't do this historically manually. It would just be impossible. Tracking in real time 5,000 ingredients and where issues started bubbling up or there were changes in sentiment, we would flag that to them as anomalies, essentially. And we would say, okay, this ingredient that you use in sunscreen products, it's picking up a lot of negative sentiment on academic journals or in the blogosphere. And you, you should be aware of that, potentially get ahead of that. And what's interesting, just to use that one example, uh, about eight months later, it went absolutely mainstream that that particular ingredient was damaging for coral reefs. And, you know, a number of consumer goods companies had to totally change their ingredient makeup and their supply chain management related to that ingredient. So it's it's these you have to know what questions you want to ask of the data. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it doesn't come up with new hypotheses. But, you know, every senior communications leader, they, you know, they know their industry. They know their company back to front. They know those issues, potential risks or opportunities that they need to be aware of. And I think for the first time, you can actually encode in a platform like Signal th that sort of hy hypothesis to validate against. And then the technology can monitor all the world's media and all the world's social and all the world's regulatory data for you in the background. And if it's good and it, and it does what it says on the tin, it can start surfacing those issues for you faster and more effectively. And I think that can help with getting ahead of crises. I think that can help inform strategy. And I think it can also help uh, communications professionals better measure 
the impact of the work that they're doing and they're, and they're, they're off to iterate uh, on that more effectively because we all know that measurement has been a huge challenge uh, within this industry, how to measure and what to measure. And again, I think for the first time, machine learning is providing the beginnings of a capability to do that more, more effectively. I just thought that example was fascinating in terms of risk mit mitigation at the business impact level, in addition to the reputation level, which I think is really fascinating. I know you and I have talked a lot about, you know, reputation based decision making um, that we're just in a world where, um, you know, leadership has to really think about reputation when they make business decisions, um, which is really interesting. Talk to us about ESG. How is Signal helping? its clients in, in the world of ESG, tracking predictions, whatever. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I mean, I mean we've talked a lot about this uh, as well, this topic as well. And I think, you know, ESG has become the all encompassing, you know, term, but, 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 you know, this past year has surfaced clearly more issues than ever before, you know, COVID and healthcare and the, the, the disparity with which society was impacted by, by this pandemic you know, Black Lives Matter movement, climate change, you know, all of these topics are starting to be kind of encompassed under this broad um, umbrella of, of ESG. And I, I think clearly they've never been more important uh, and, 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 and also most importantly, never been a, a, such a clear driver for long-term financial performance. And I think that's why, you know, in, in your world of asset management, you know, it's, it's being lent into so, so, so aggressively. Um, so I think what, what, what we feel though, is that kind of measuring performance against ESG is, is a really flawed area and that currently the status quo, there's a lot of measurement companies out there that measure ESG, but they typically measure it based on what the company produces and provides in their disclosures. So what the company says they're going to do in relation to mm -hmm. ESG, rather than what they might actually do in the wild and how what they're doing in the wild is actually perceived. And so what we feel is there's an opportunity to provide more of an outside in perspective rather than focusing on what the company says they're going to do in their disclosures or their, their public statements, looking at how they actually lived up to the obligations and objectives they made related to ESG. And perhaps, again, coming back to the supply chain point, whether their suppliers and partners uh, and, and counterparties are also living and reflecting those, those values. And I think we're starting to see uh, clients you know, both on the, on the on the client side as well as the agencies and consulting firms that advise them want to get that outside in picture as much as they want to get the inside out uh, view. And I think those two things have to go hand in hand. I believe also over time, the 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 asset management industry will move to requiring both. They'll want to see both what the company says, but also what the company importantly does as well. Um, and that's obviously a key stakeholder group in in, in this area of ESG. I'd also be curious, you're walking the halls of a lot of agencies and a lot of corp comms departments. I'd be curious, um, you know, how fast and furiously are these technologies being used? Um, has the industry, you know, matured quite a bit? Where are we in the, in the cycle of adoption of these uh, technologies? Yeah, if I'm if I'm I being truthful, I, I, do, I see a little smirk, which tells me maybe we're I down. Think there's, I think there's a big. I think there's a big divide. I think there's a big delta, and I think there's quite a journey. This this market still needs to go on. Um, what we clearly see is that there are, you know, as is typical in that kind of adoption bell curve, there are innovators and disruptors, people who are taking the technology and the data and using it in increasingly sophisticated ways. And then I think there's a, a much longer tail of organizations who are going through a journey of becoming more data literate and understanding how this technology and this data can be used to inform strategic decision making. I think historically, the, 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 the industry, the comms tech industry was perceived as a kind of necessary evil. It was there to keep you out of trouble. It was there to make sure that you got your clips once, you know, once a day. And it was there for the monthly or quarterly reputation analysis book that you could then kick up to the C-suite and make sure that they knew you, you know, what you were doing had had some credence or was making some impact. I think there needs to be a mindset shift. I don't think the industry has gone through that fully yet. We're actually, that's totally the wrong way to look at this technology and data. We need to be using this to, this needs to be, we need to be a partner to our clients. And this data and technology needs to be used to drive decision-making in a really informed, meaningful, integrated way. And, 
you know, we all look on at the marketing industry and that has just been totally disrupted and overwhelmed by MarTech and data yeah. and distribution. We don't need to copy that because I think, if, you know, there's been this new trend, which is moving towards a world where like trying to attribute comms like it's marketing and it's not in my view. And I think that's a bit of a, a false promise, mm -hmm. but we need to look at what are the ways to measure you know, the impact of our work and how do we use data to do that just as effectively in comms, but in its own, in its own rightful place. Um, and so there, you know, you saw the right smile because you know, <laughs> we're a little bit going on that journey with our customers and there's some, sometimes there's reticence, sometimes there's uh, friction in doing that. And that's been for us as a company being completely open. We've had to both provide the status quo and deliver what people get today. And that meant comprehensive coverage, you know, media monitoring, human analysis, and all the things that people need today. And I'm not suggesting those, those will go away. And then build up from that with our clients to try and use data to inform, uh, you know, their strategic decision making over time as well. And so that, that, that's definitely been a journey that we're on. I hope I say your name correctly. Minky, you've asked a great question. If you're still on, would you like to ask it about an example you'd like to see? I don't know if you're still on the line. Yeah. I yeah. Hi, I'm still on the line. Great. Hey, thanks, uh, David. Interesting presentation. <clears throat> I'm trying to, um, to get my camera working. There we go. <laughs> I was just wondering, David, um, would you have, if needed, an anonymized example of a company that has a major shift in its communications approach because of the use of the data insights that you were able to provide them? Yeah, brilliant question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the, in the examples I, I gave before, um, you know, there are, some, there are some very powerful shifts that have, have occurred there. I mean, the cabinet office, I mean, it was, you know, the work we were doing with the government during the time of, of COVID here in the UK was fascinating. I mean, we were, the data we were providing was going to the highest levels in terms of, you know, informing how they then communicated uh, and, and, and spoke to the country uh, during obviously this, this, this shocking crisis. And sometimes we were giving them insights and, and what was changing and uh, moving sentiment. And they were then uh, affecting their, their, their communication strategy in real time based off the back of that data. So that, that's probably the most recent and powerful example, but a couple others that, that I think could be interesting. One, we were working also with a global retailer, a uh, very large retailer here in the UK, but, but with a global presence during the time of uh, COVID. And again, we were providing, providing them the data and the insights as to when they should close and reopen their stores country by country. And they were doing that as a reputation-based decision, not as a, what was a regulatory-based decision. So they weren't just following guidelines. I'm sure many of you guys in your companies were figuring out that issue. Should we close our, should we close our offices? How should we communicate this to our clients? For a retailer, obviously, you know, that is their business. And this comes back to this topic that Jen and I have been discussing at depth recently, which is about this shift from C-suite moving from, you know, co co commercial-based decision-making alone into a world where they think about decision-making based on reputation implications as well. And sometimes the commercial decision that you make isn't necessarily the best reputation decision that you make. Jen's got a great example. Maybe she can give about her own business. Um, but actually C-suite need to, think in this way now because the wrong reputation based decision making can have a much greater more negative impact on the business over the mid to long term and so that's a great example where actually the c-suite at that retailer had decided they were going to make that decision based on media perception and, and reputation not based on necessarily what was the right thing for the bottom line for them and one other final quick example i'll give we're working with one of the world's largest consulting firms now they have a, a, a goal of being the most trusted consulting firm in any form of consulting. They're in a specific area of consulting by 2030. Really difficult thing to measure and probably even a harder thing to achieve given some of the mistrust around uh, their particular area of consulting as it stands. <laughs> What's fascinating there is, again, historic analysis in this area would have been limited probably to media, maybe with a peppering of social media in it. We're bringing in internal employee data. So they're doing very deep surveys of the employee base. We're bringing in um, external client feedback data, like really deep, rich MPS data from clients, et cetera. And we're weaving the, the four data sets together to provide a holistic view of trust. 
And so that's that kind of intersection. We're, we're just really getting going, but it's fascinating to bring these different disparate data sets together into a single uh, into a single view and understand how these different things interplay against one another. Uh, there's a question here. Um, oh, I just want to, uh, Dasha Stewart, are you still on the line? Would you like to ask your question? You might have lost that person. Um, Tim Penning. She's, she's there, but she was on mute. Oh, okay. Let's give her a second. Dasha is still there? I'm still here, yeah. Okay, great. Yes, we can. Great. Um, mine was more of a comment uh, in the former industry coming from healthcare. I can see what you were describing in terms of getting ahead of ingredient um, sentiment that can really help you leapfrog, especially if you're in the food industry um, or the um, healthcare industry to get to regulatory first. That could be a real leg up. I thought that was really interesting. I was wondering though, when we talk about trust, does the, does the consumer awareness or the uh, broader stakeholder awareness that you're using AI um, to, um, to understand what's going on, does that in some way um, reduce the trust that they have in you in terms of being, feeling manipulated? Oh gosh, uh, great question. I mean, m most of the most of the data that we we typically are analyzing is publicly available data. So we're not we're not a survey business, and we don't use AI for, for for that area. So it's very rare that we're getting we're sourcing personal informational insights from individuals. Although increasingly, as I used in that last example with that consulting firm, they they run a survey with a third party business and have done for many years, and they do pulse surveys by their their HR team. And they're introducing that data set alongside the media and social and regulatory data that we have access to. And so what we're also finding, just, just to illustrate that, is that, in, again, in some of our more sophisticated strategic clients, this, this kind of area of reputation and trust is becoming a cross-functional exercise rather than something just held by the, the chief communications officer or the, the, the PR and comms team. It's actually saying to the HR team, we want to also bring in employee perception of trust and we want to bring in client perception of trust that, that that's maybe customer services or or the client facing uh, functions um, and then what's important i think is we're actually going to use that trust measure to understand how it correlates with business performance so that becomes a cfo issue you know not a, a cco issue and so i think this kind of this world where we bring these cross-functional data sets from different teams together and we weave a holistic view of how trust and reputation and perception impact business performance. Um, I think that's going to be a vital part of measuring and action and, and, and attributing the, the, the work that's done uh, by the comms team, as opposed to what I've seen more recently, this trend of trying to put a pound value on comms mm -hmm. you know, through the use of cookies. Um, again, there may be differing views on, 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 on the chat here, but um, I think that speaks to a very limited part of what communications professionals are tasked and responsible for. As I well. think the EY example is fascinating how they're putting their audit clients um, reputational trust score or whatever through the system and taking that that seriously um, and probably putting a value on it. That's really interesting. Tim Penning, you had a question. I don't know if you're still on the line. I am here, thank you. I'm right. fascinated in your comment about uh, aggregating data globally and, and and then translating it into English, but there's so much we're reading now about uh, less of this information being forthcoming from China, Russia, the Middle East. Uh, just this morning, the Oscar-winning Chinese director mm -hmm. um, that was not allowed by Chinese media, I'm not sure exactly why, but can, can you speak to how you gather data or maybe how you can analyze it? Is there a big caveat that goes with it that it's not fully representative of populations or something like that? Yeah, so certainly. Um, interestingly, Russia is actually better than than elements of what, what, what one can act in terms of China. In terms of media coverage, we're actually pretty well covered in both of those markets, interestingly. And, and that's because 
those media sources, you know, most of the media, if not all of the media that we access is licensed content. And so we go out and we pay copyright fees for our clients to be able to then access that premium content, whether it be in print or behind the paywall or even online media as well. And so those media organizations in both those markets see that as a monetization opportunity and therefore are more willing to share the, the media data. And so we've actually got very decent coverage in both Russia and China. When it comes to social data, uh, I think that becomes uh, slightly trickier, particularly in uh, in China. Um, I know there are certain social media platforms in Russia that are more open source, but um, our, so our focus has been on trying to get as much comprehensive coverage as we can globally, uh, including those markets. So, some, you know, some concentration and breadth and depth is better in some regions than others, definitely. So Brian Holton made a good comment about the opportunity for communications people to be more proactive than reactive, but the data allows us to do that. Um, any more examples of that? I mean, I think, again, the Unilever example to me is awesome to be able to walk into your CEO's office and say, hey, look, we're seeing risks. We're seeing we're going from pink to red on these ingredients. We need to do something about it. To me, I thought that was just one of the most fascinating um, examples. Any more of that sort of ability to give comms like something proactive in their hands to bring to senior management to make a business decision? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think I think though to just before it's it's I think that that is one of the most powerful points uh, to make that ability to be proactive because I think that you know there is no substitute as I mentioned already for the specialized industry knowledge. And the and the capability, the human capabilities, you know, that experts and, and professionals have. But we also know that given the amount, you know, the volume, the sheer volume, the pace of information in the world, that this this machine learning technology that is an enabler of that kind of higher quality, more proactive work. Um, and this is where we, you know, we 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 push this message message of augmentation, where we believe that these AI powered tools. Um, you know, will enable these insights to be surfaced in the moment and, and that the platform will be used almost as an extension uh, to the decision-making capabilities of, of, of both business and, uh, and comms leaders. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's, that's very much aligned with how, how we think about the future of, of this landscape. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of other uh, interesting examples I can give. I've already given. A, a well, couple. let me get, let me while you're thinking. Let me ask another question. Like we've talked a lot about, you know, you sort of have two types of business, right? You're, you're sort of bread and butter media monitoring, but it's obviously AI enabled and it can do so much more. And then you have which is sort of our daily work. Everybody needs that platform, right? And then you've got the customized platform that the EYs and the Unilevers are. using using to really make, you know, proactive business decisions on your bread and butter product, because some of the companies on the line won't be into spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on you. Talk about the bread and butter product and why it's so much better because it is and how you can actually use it. One, one of my frustrations is um, I feel like we use, um, you know, it's like a cell phone. Like what percentage do you use of the power of what this thing can do? Probably like 50%. I feel like sometimes even on the monitoring level, we don't all use what the power of that data could be. Talk about that. Talk about the bread and butter product because everyone on this line needs the best daily monitoring insights, et cetera, et cetera. Definitely. So, I mean, I think the first thing is, is to say that everything we're building in our platform, all of that value we're creating, we're trying to productize in our SaaS products as well as make enable, you know, en enable customers to access via our API products or through these custom solutions, uh, uh, the likes of which EY have built, have built uh, as one example. So everything we, we're gearing towards is that any lay person, they don't have to be technical, can come onto our product and, and search over the data and find the insights that they're looking for and create the dashboards and surface the insights that might inform their decision making. And so one of the things I encourage our customers to do at whatever level, I think this is, it's often been perceived that the most junior people in the organization are the ones who do the monitoring and do the data gathering. And yes, for a large bulk of the day-to-day -day work, that should be true. But actually I'm trying to encourage even the most senior people to engage and lean in on the technology and become familiar with it. Because, you know, it's like in our consumer lives, we've all gotten incredibly used to using these things and having a million and one apps on our iPhone and being able to interact with those 
applications and get real value out of them, we got to start thinking about our enterprise software relationship in a similar sense. Now, a huge responsibility lies with the providers to make that experience intuitive and frictionless and for the products to just work. But I think there's also got to be a purposeful approach from the more senior folks within the organizations to say, we're going to engage with this technology and, and, and get the value out of it ourselves. And, and then almost show the junior people the path of, of, of what can be done with that. And I think, so that's something that we, we, we actively encourage our, our clients to do. In terms of you know, the, the core SaaS products and, and, and what differentiates uh, the business, I think it fundamentally boils down to a, a couple of key things. The first is the, the breadth and the depth and the global nature of the content, which we've already touched upon. It's the fact that we're starting to marry up and integrate multi a multitude of different types of data into a single platform, because we all know a, a story can break in the social world on a blog or uh, through a tweet, go into traditional media, become a huge issue. Six months later, it leads to regulatory change. We don't think those should be separate products and separate mm -hmm. experiences. We think you need a holistic, consistent view. And we think the data needs to be global, multilingual, so that you can pick up an issue that's happening in Asia as much as you can in the, in the Western world and in English languages as well. The second uh, core area of, I guess, differentiation and focus is, is, is this AIQ pipeline that I mentioned before. And what this starts enabling our customers to do, or what I describe it as, is quantifying the qualitative. It's, it's taking fuzzy qualitative concepts and, and, and concepts and enabling the technology to quantify and score articles of their relevance to those issues. So that enables us to figure out whether a document is about a topic or a concept or a theme or an issue. It lets, you know, when, when you say to a CEO, what do you want your business to be famous for? They'll be able to tell you, well, we can actually measure against those topics and concepts and what they want to be famous for now. And that's through the use of applying machine learning. I think we all got very caught up four or five years ago on sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. Sentiment analysis is still a quite an inaccurate. You know, if I asked everyone on this uh, on this Zoom call to all score the same news article, whether it was positive, negative, or neutral, uh, you know, data proves that we probably agree about fifty five percent of us would agree. It's a very subjective thing. So, sentiment analysis is just one tool. It's just one component in a symphony of different tools that we use that can enable us to basically contextually understand what an article or document is about, and then score, qu quantify over time, the aggregate trends uh, related to that. That's so great. that piece about quantifying the qualitative is absolutely essential. And then once we've done that, this, what I've explained before, and I realize it's quite techy, but this mm -hmm. knowledge mm -hmm. we're building, the ability to map these billions and billions of relationships between organizations, people, issues, diseases, ingredients, regulations, concepts, reputation drivers, that map that we're creating is going to start enabling our customers and, and in our products, the asking and answering of, as I mentioned before, increasingly sophisticated questions. We believe and starting to prove, I think, that via that knowledge graph, we can get people ahead of corporate crises faster, that we can unearth strategic insights or opportunities that could be unknown unknowns, um, and that we can help them measure their reputation, perception, and trust uh, in a much more accurate uh, an effective way. So, um, yeah, those are some of the things that we, we're thinking Great. about doubling down into with our, with our platform. Great. We've got one last question, but I want to point out Georgie from Signal has pointed out a white paper on the subject of measuring the impact of PR roadmap to true value. Check it out. It's in the chat. Um, last question. If uh, Jill Salette is still on the line, go ahead, Jill, and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Jen, and thanks, David. This has really been fascinating. In my, uh, I've just, I've just left my most recent role, and they are to the point you made, David, early in their ESG journey. They're early as a company; they're only a couple years old. So it just had me thinking, and they're and they're in the industrial space. It had me thinking about whether you've been able to get to maybe the more B two B side of the world. Who, who tend to have this sentiment, well, we're not consumer facing, so reputation really isn't on our minds quite so much. Yes. Yeah, no, I think, I think again, if, yeah, if we would have asked this, that same question three or four years ago, we, you know, we probably would have gotten a very different answer. I think the, the, just the, what, what's happened over the last few years politically and, and from a societal perspective, but particularly in this last year with the, with the, with the pandemic, uh, and with a number of these, you know, incredibly important issues 
uh, bubbling up around the world, that that policy is no longer a uh, one that lasts very long. I, I don't think it lasts very long. And, you know, we just, there are so many examples of, you know, even recently chairman of KPMG having to stand down here in the UK uh, because he, you know, he misspoke to his, to his employee base about uh, what he expects that to, for them to work extra hours despite the pandemic and they shouldn't be complaining, you know, cause they're stressed, you know, or, you know, we've had, you know, just many, many examples, I think, uh, where a, a wrong reputation decision can lead to, you know, people getting fired and, and share prices plummeting. And I think for the first time, both in the B2C and the B2B landscape, certainly from what we're seeing in that ESG world, the money's following those with 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 the real with a real strategy um, who don't just, you know, talk about it, but actually live the, live the values that they espouse. And so I think, you know, in the consumer world, that's, you know, are the customers uh, speaking with their with their dollars, but I think now, and even in the B two B world, um, the, the the finance world is starting to do that. One of our advisory board members is Chuka Muna, who left government in the UK, uh, the Labour Party, to join Edelman briefly, and then has has since joined uh, J P Morgan to head up the ESG um, the ESG division there. Um, you know, and I think that's just one example of you know a yeah. lot of thinkers and talkers in this space are now moving to, to, to where the decisions are made. In yeah, yeah, I can weigh in on that too. I mean, most of the clients we have are in B2B professional services or financial services. Everyone is newly obsessed with getting this right. And um, it's been fascinating that, you know, for my whole career, I spent my whole career educating and trying to convince clients that they needed to care and that you don't have to do that anymore. So I think this is across all industries for sure. I'm going to turn this back over to Elliot to wrap it up, but, um, you know, please do ask any further questions of David or Georgie or the signal team directly after this, they'd be happy to, um, entertain any questions about anything that's on your mind related to this. Um, Elliot, close us out. Happy to do that, Jen. Uh, thank you so much, David, for being our guest today and also the signal AI for supporting page as a patron. Jen, thanks for hosting. And of course, thanks to all of you for being with us today.